fellow at Harvard Law School's Labor and Work Life Program. He's the author of uh, five best-selling books, and many of you may have read them, From incre Incremental to Exponential, Your Happiness Was Hacked, The Driver and the Driverless Car, Innovating Women, and The Immigrant Exodus. He is writing, he's been writing regularly for the Washington Post and several other journals, including uh, all leading journals. And he's been at the Carnegie Mellon School, Duke University, Stanford Law School, UC Berkeley, Emory University, and Singularity University. He's based in Silicon Valley and he researches, speaks, writes on all cutting edge deep tech areas, including robotics, artificial intelligence, computing, synthetic biology, 3D printing, medicine, nano materials, and many more. So I'm just cutting it short because I'd rather prefer to uh, listen to him rather than speak about him. So over to you. Thank you, Mita. I'm going to give you a crash course in uh, the future and what's becoming possible right now. So let me switch over the presentation now. Can we get it up and going? Because I spoke here a couple of years ago, and, and I talked about a lot of things that were going to become possible. I also talked about exponentials. And now we've all become experts on exponentials. In fact, we are literally sick of seeing exponential charts. Uh, can we get my clicker working? Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Exponentials. We're literally sick of exponentials. The good thing is that now uh, we've all learned what exponentials mean. When I used to teach uh, about advancing technologies before, I'd have to walk people through uh, examples. I don't need to do that because the best example is what happened with the pandemic, how it caught everyone by surprise. But the history of technology is exponential. It took thousands of years to go from agriculture to pottery to the plow to mathematics, and then bang, over the last 100 years, We've had advance after advance after advance. People don't seem to understand this. They think linearly, and they don't understand how fast things are changing. And it's not just computing. I mean, this device I have in my hand, about 30 years ago, if I was coming through uh, customs, I would have been arrested by the US, not by India, for trying to carry supercomputers in my uh, pocket. I mean, they, supercomputers were you know, bigger than many buildings are. But the fact is that they were export controls to India against supercomputers. This device in my hand and that you have in, all, in your purses and pockets is about 100 times more powerful than the crazy supercomputers that had export controls on them. Now, what's happening is that everything that computing touches is advancing exponentially. AI, robotics, 3D printing, virtual reality, network sensors, everything is on an exponential path. And Again, we don't realize it because what happens with linear trends is that things move very, very slowly. You, know, you go from point one to point two, forever nothing happens. And then a technology starts trending upwards and we go from uh, uh, denial and disappointment to absolute amazement. This is the way technologies go. All right, so having you know, said all of that, I'm gonna now start talking about the impacts of these technologies. Let's start with medicine, which is dear and near dear to all of our hearts. I don't know if you realize this or not, but Apple is now in the business of selling medical devices. Apple has become <coughs> a medical device company. When did this happen? Over the last three or four or five years, it happened very quietly. Apple announced an Apple Watch, and then it announced all these new features in it. Apple is now in the uh, me medical business. In fact, what's happened is that medicine has become digital and information technology. What is India's core strength when it comes to technology? It's being able to build IT systems, manage IT systems, maintain IT systems, and use technology in different ways. Well, guess what? Medicine itself has become an information technology right now. So if I was working, you know, working for any of the major IT companies here, I would go to the CEOs and say, you know, wake up. You're not, what are you doing in the medical field? Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, all of these major US companies are now investing heavily in medicine. I don't think that uh, either of the uh, major tech companies are doing it seriously. Of course, they'll have some brochures which say that they're doing something in healthcare, but they really aren't. They don't seem to realize that this transition happened because they're not thinking exponentially, they're thinking linearly. And then uh, genomic sequencing. The first genome sequence in the year 2000, it cost about $2.75 billion. 
Today, it costs less than $500 to sequence a human genome, which means that we've become data. Human beings have become data. And what do you do with data? You use AI to analyze it. And it's an IT problem to deal with genomics. So the composition of life itself has become information technology. This is very relevant for Niti Aayog to understand, to, uh, to have India's companies to understand and have entrepreneurs to understand because they're still thinking about IT the way they did 10 years ago. They don't seem to realize that IT has eaten the world now. And therefore, their market opportunities have increased exponentially. It's a wake up time for Indian industry because now we will soon be able to cure every disease. What is disease? Disease is symptoms. It's uh, caused by genes and proteins. If you look at uh, a, you know, a map of all of the connections between these, there are only about 150,000 connections between um, a few hundred symptoms and a few thousand diseases. You could analyze all of this with an Excel spreadsheet. But if you're going to look at it in the, com in, in the full complexity, it's a job for AI. So therefore, curing disease is a function of IT. This has all changed. I'm going to get back to this in a while and show you what this is making possible. Now, um, in India, you didn't have microRNA-based uh, vaccines. I got uh, one of the first Pfizer vaccines that came out, Moderna. I, well, I mean, I now have been triple vaccinated before I came to India. I got two Pfizer and one Moderna, all microRNA. You know something that it took 48 hours from Moderna to go from having uh, the genome sequence that was smuggled out of China to now finding uh, a way of building a vaccine for the uh, COVID. 48 hours. All they had to do was to get the genetic sequence, identify a target, and the platform that has been built for the last 30 years is the microRNA delivery mechanism. With it, they were able to attack the target, <coughs> and the results were amazing. The highest you know, uh, efficacy of, of any vaccines in history. 48 hours. It took many months to test this. And that's something which I'm, I'm going to uh, be telling you more yeah, about, yeah. how India can, can fix that problem. But essentially, this is an IT problem. And just a second. Just a second. Yeah. And by the time China engineers the next uh, you know, pandemics, we will have the ability to uh, uh, build the antiviruses for the viruses that they're creating. Uh, you know, frankly, I believe that China engineered this thing by accident. COVID. This is a controversial thing to say, but I think it was a lab experiment in China. And there's a lot of controversy about this. I hesitate to say this loudly in America because it becomes uh, uh, you know, a left versus right issue. But the fact is that I wrote an article for Hindustan Times. I wrote two articles for Hindustan Times warning India that uh, even if this wasn't engineered, even if I'm wrong, the next pandemic could be engineered. Therefore, you better build your antivirus defenses because we can now build the defense system. As soon as someone engineers a pandemic, we can now uh, develop the uh, uh, solution for it. Because the microRNA platform has now been tested, proven. It's simply a matter of now identifying targets and keep, keep adding to that platform. So medicine has become an information technology. So now let's switch, switch gears and talk about solving a matter's grand challenges. I'm going to talk to the, about the big picture and tell you about why, why I'm in India. First of all, one of the biggest problems in the world is energy. Whether you're in a village in Africa or, I mean, India has gotten a lot better at this, but even in parts of India and even in the big cities, you know, very often there's no light. So when children come home, they can't study. And there's so many uh, problems created by not having energy. But this problem is about to be fixed. Because if you look at this chart that I just put up here, this is a map of the energy reserves of our planet. We get 1,400 times more energy every single day than the entire planet consumes in a year. We focus on petroleum, on diesel, on coal. But look at that chart. Those are tiny little uh, uh, you know, balls versus the big one, which is solar. The problem so far is, has been that we have not been able to mine the solar energy. Well, guess what? We are on exponential curves. Uh, with solar. The installations keep doubling. As the installations double, the price drops. As the price drops, the installations double. We are in a virtuous cycle of exponential advances in uh, solar energy. We know renewables are reaching tipping points. I mean, uh, I know that uh, Amitabh and um, uh, Niti Aayog and uh, the Indian government has done a lot to advance the cost of, cost of solar. And 
Uh, I wrote an article for Foreign Policy about how India is actually exceeding its uh, its targets in, in, uh, that, that were made to the Paris Accord. <clears throat> All of that is wonderful, but it's happening in autopilot right now because we soon we're going to reach tipping points so that uh, if you build a new house in uh, the West, it doesn't make economic sense to be buying from the grid anymore. In India, it won't make economic sense to have these dirty generators that are all over the country because the cost of diesel will be far more than the cost of uh, solar panels. So you'll see a mass replacement cycle because it's an autopilot. The cost keeps dropping 18 to 20% every year. So if you look at it, you're headed towards zero. I wrote this article in 2014 for the Washington Post. I said that, look, when I look at the data, when I look at the exponential trends, we're headed towards zero. We're headed towards an era of unlimited clean energy. Now, Amitav has been, been uh, you know, uh, a friend for a long time, and he's been reading my controversial articles. This one created more controversy in the United States than almost any article I've written, because I said in this article that within the next few years, the utility industry is, is uh, going to start lobbying against clean energy, and that uh, utilities are going to start going bankrupt. The utilities went wild when they saw this, started lodging complaints with the, United, with the Washington Post saying, this guy is an idiot, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Their argument was that the sun doesn't shine when it's not sunny, the wind doesn't blow when it's not windy. My response was, duh, I know that, <laughs> because battery storage is also increasing exponentially. So therefore, it's, an, uh, you know, it's unstoppable right now. Electric storage has been dropping at amazing rates as well. So much so that prices of uh, battery storage dropped to one-tenth what they were in 2010, and they will halve again by 2025, and they'll reach a tipping point that uh, instead of having uh, you know, diesel backups, it'll be cheaper to replace everything with batteries and solar panels. So what you'll start seeing all across India and all across the world by 2025 or so, give or take a year, because of all the craziness of these uh, you know, technologies, is that consumers will start flipping over to clean energy because it makes economic sense. What the government is doing won't matter, because as you know, in India, consumers drive everything. That they make their own decisions and, and everything gets onto autopilot once the economics change. That's what's gonna happen with these technologies. And then, EVs are going to take over uh, our roads because it will not make sense to be buying uh, uh, you know, petrol-consuming vehicles or even LPG-consuming vehicles when electric vehicles are so much cheaper. This happens within the next five years, regardless of what the government does, because the core cost of these technologies is on exponential curves. So if I was Niti Aayog, what I would start doing now is looking at the exponential curves Rather than worrying about um, you know, telling people to, to have EVs, I'd start thinking about, okay, what will happen now when we flip the switch and we have uh, the car companies, every car company in the world by 2025, 2027, in that time frame, is going to discontinue producing fossil fuel consuming vehicles. Why? Because it won't make economic sense for them to be selling those because customers aren't buying them anymore. So what does that mean now? Well, it means that there are going to be regional problems here because you won't have enough electricity in parts of India. Consumers are going to be demanding it. So which means that we have to start thinking about uh, uh, having solar uh, you know, arrays, having battery backups, having uh, other forms of clean energy, maybe wind energy, and storing that energy so that you can support the infrastructure. India needs to get ready for this. Uh, rather than you know, worrying about making it happen, we have to worry about what happens when it happens because this is inevitable, it's unstoppable. Now let's talk about a problem I have every, every time I come to India, I get sick. Despite the fact you have RO and uh, UV devices everywhere, and then you have bottled water everywhere, the bottled water is awful. I get sick from the bottled water here because it still contains contaminants. And on top of that, you have all this dirty plastic in these bottled water. Uh, you know, bottled, we, and bottled water costs more, more than, uh, than uh, you know, Coca-Cola costs uh, you know, in many places more than wine costs in California, right? And the problem is that nothing has disrupted the water market for the past 50, 60, 70 years. It's been stagnant. And all we can do is keep getting better filters, you know, better um, um, uh, versions of the same old, crappy, ancient, obsolete technologies. <clears throat> this is a problem that an entrepreneur in Chile decided to solve about a decade ago. 
His name is Alfredo Zalesi. I'm, I was an advisor to the president of Chile. And I went there about 10, 11 years ago to look at the, the system. And I met a lot of entrepreneurs in Chile. And I came across one technology which completely blew me away. Because this scientist showed me a device that he had built that converted water into plasma and back into water. I said, Alfredo, you're talking about a basic science breakthrough that should win you a Nobel Prize. What happened there? He was in Chile. And if you're in Chile, it's like being in India five years ago, that you can have the greatest invention. And uh, it's, as they say in Hindi, ghar ki murgi dal barabar. No one takes you seriously. That this is the problem that entrepreneurs in India have, that they have the greatest inventions, and no one takes them seriously. Now, I've got to give credit to Niti Ayog, and this is why I'm such a big fan of Amitabh's, is because Niti Ayog has been working very hard to increase entrepreneurship. The Atal Innovation Mission that you, you folks launched, and a lot of other initiatives you made, uh, and you, were, you, know, you basically got through the prime minister, and you made entrepreneurship very acceptable. A decade ago, I would come here and I'd have to, you know, I gave an ink talk a few years ago, uh, making fun of um, 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 NASCOM for their 10,000 start startups thing. They said within 10 or 20 years, we'll have 10,000 startups. And I went and did an ink talk. You should watch an ink talk. And I started laughing at them. I said, I'm saying a country of a billion people, and you're talking about 10,000 startups in the next 10 years. What's wrong with you? You should have 10,000 startups happening every month here because you have so many entrepreneurs here. <coughs> the problem was that entrepreneurship wasn't cool in India. You made it cool. So getting back to Alfredo Zalesi, he happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But he developed a technology which was world changing. This is called Plasma Water Sanitation System. Watch this video to see what, this, what it does. The Plasma Water Sanitation System takes in a continuous flow of contaminated water and injects it under high pressure into a plasma reaction chamber. As pressure drops inside due to acceleration, the liquid stream transforms into a biphasic gas liquid flow. An electric field is applied to the biphasic flow, transforming it into non-thermal plasma, destroying all virus and bacteria in the water. As velocity decreases, pressure increases, turning the flow back into liquid, which is then released from the chamber, delivering clean, safe and reliable water in a continuous flow. So now, now this technology again was made in Chile, and it's like you said, made like being made in, uh, in Punjab or something. No, you know, and people just don't believe that you can have basic science breakthroughs. The, if you listen to the West, I mean, I've, I've actually had professors haranguing me, saying that you need you know, to speak to Amitabh Kant about increasing uh, funding for basic, uh, basic science. And I said, no, I mean, uh, basic science should come from entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs can, can solve the problems that academia can't. And India shouldn't try to imitate the West just because it spends so much percent of its GDP on these useless uh, uh, you know, academic exercises. In academia, it's all about getting tenure. So professors don't care about solving world problems. They care about getting tenure, getting uh, lifetime employment. Like being a you know, government servant, you can never get fired. Right? That's all they care about. Why would India put billions of dollars into that when it could be launching billions of startups or millions of startups? So um, this is an entrepreneur who made a basic science breakthrough. And when I went there, he was on, Alfredo was almost bankrupt. I said, what is wrong with this country? I, I was an advisor to the president. I actually literally uh, told uh, the president, I said, what's wrong with you people? I told the head of the, uh, the Corfo is their economic development agency. So the head of uh, the Corfo, uh, Amitabh's equivalent, I, I had dinner with him and said, um, what is wrong with you idiots? Literally, that's what I said to him. He said, you've got one of the greatest scientists I've, in the world I've ever come across, and you won't invest in him. He's saying, well, it's, you know, uh, he has to submit all this, these, these you know, grants and paperwork as no validation. This is like, I said, you folks are worse than India. Uh, you have a bigger bureaucracy, and uh, you, you, know, you claim to be a, a, a developed country or developing uh, uh, up in the development cycle. Anyway, long story, so I, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm, <laughs> I got together with Ratan Tata. And I said, Ratan, here's a technology from Chile. He says, Vic, I'll write a check for $250,000. Immediately, he got Venkan Ramachandra and his uh, head of the, uh, the Tata Trust to, to invest in this company. And based on Ratan Tata invested, investing, a lot of other people invested, and we funded Alfredo. And the company you know, uh, started building uh, technology professionally. So 2016. This is the president of Chile, the new, the old, uh, uh, Michelle Bachelet. She rolled out the first village-sized unit of this technology, which could provide 100% clean uh, water. Uh, 1,700 watts is what it consumed. 
uh, the device cost about twenty or thirty thousand dollars to to build. A village size unit with the cleanest water you can possibly have. And then Airbus came along two years later, uh, three years later, and said, "Well, we want a unit for airplanes." So I'll further miniaturize it down to 600 watts and a device like that, which is enough clean water for a village. And then what happened? COVID happened. And Alfredo's company almost went bankrupt again. So um, long story, but then Alfredo went back to the basics and he said, what else can I do with this technology? And I'll show you in a minute what the outcome of that was, because the next grand challenge which needs to be solved is food. Now, this will sound crazy, but we can now uh, synthetically produce meat. Okay. Um, a lot of the greenhouse gases aren't caused by, uh, um, by cars. They're caused by animals, by cows uh, letting out gases. And uh, it's really uh, cruel what we do to animals. A large percentage of the, of the land on this planet is used for raising animals that we slaughter. It's cruel, inhuman. But you know something? We can 3D print meat now. Within the next five years or, so, four years or so, we're going to be debating whether you're going to eat 3D printed beef or most times they're going to eat uh, 3D printed pork. Because it will be economical, it will be cheaper in the West within five years to be synthetically producing meat. So now the debate for the Hindus is going to be, are you going to eat a cow which is 3D printed when a, you know, you, a cow wasn't killed to give you that meat? Well, then the, the, what, I've asked a number of Hindu friends about that, or Muslim friends. They say it's, it's saying, well, it's still from a cow. The tissue was taken from a cow. Well, what if you could simply uh, go over to your IT department and say, can you please since, uh, replicate the genome of a cow and give us uh, 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 you know, a map by which we can print this thing? So literally, there was no cow taken, and it, but it's pure beef. Will Hindus eat that? Will Muslims eat the pork? These are debates we're going to be soon be having. So this is coming. Start looking into this technology because this could be transformative for India as well, providing protein at an inexpensive cost. And then vertical farms. This is also going to be disruptive. You know, I talked about the cost of energy dropping to zero. Well, you can grow um, uh, food in buildings right now with LED lights. There were two Nobel Prizes given out for LED lights over the last few years. So now we can grow vegetables in buildings so one of the big problems in uh, big cities like Delhi is that you have to transport food from farms which are you know, many, very, very far away. And uh, by having them out there, it's polluted and so on. What if you could grow in buildings and have all the food that you want? Vertical farms are coming. And when the cost of energy drops to about zero, vertical farms become cheaper than even farming in India. This is coming. So you need to start understanding these disruptions. And then let's talk about the next revolution in agriculture. Getting back to my friend um, Alfredo Zalezi, what he discovered was, he, you know, this is the way entrepreneurs are. And this is a lesson that you need to teach your entrepreneurs because you're mentoring <laughs> a lot of companies, they keep failing. What you do is get those companies to go back to basics and say, okay, what else can you do? Your company failed to market the products that it had built, but what else can you do with your technology? Which is exactly what Alfredo did. And what he learned was that there's a secret to how uh, Mother Nature works. How does Mother Nature enrich this uh, earth? I was just in Kerala, and Kerala is one of the most fertile places in this country, except Kerala has lightning like you've never seen before. Lightning is the fourth state of matter, plasma. Remember I showed that cube? Uh, what happens is that when plasma goes through the air, the air is 78% nitrogen, and then you have some oxygen. When you put plasma through uh, oxygen and nitrogen, you get nitrates. What a nitrates fertilizer. And then when you add an oxygen molecule to the water, you get H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. What's hydrogen peroxide? A disinfectant. So what Alfredo realized was that he could just do a software change, and now software upgrade to his device, tweak the parameters, add more air to it, and he can generate plasma-activated water. What's plasma-activated water? Plasma-activated water is nature's magic. It, the H2O2 breaks down biofilms and kills bacteria. It, it basically is like a, a, a vaccine that you give a human being, which teaches, gives you antibodies to defend yourself from viruses. And it can create nitrates, so it's like superfood. It can turn crops into superfoods. So this was a discovery that Alfredo just made by accident, um, you know, uh, doing that. So, so uh, one of the things which um, you know, Siddhi and Narman are working with me on, thanks to uh, Meta, 
is to look into bringing this technology to India. We're going to be running two pilots uh, in one queue next year. The, the, the technology is the same as the water technology. It's those Airbus size units, they cost a few thousand dollars to produce. They can produce 10 liters of water a minute. We can produce 10 liters of plasma activated water a minute, enough to replicate lightning. So this technology is coming to India and it could launch the next green revolution, increase crop yields by 30, 40%, eliminate the use of fertilizers, eliminate the use of pesticides, literally transform India. And this is what I'm gonna be focused on uh, next year because the technology is, has been 10 years in development now, thanks to Ratan Tata. It, it took someone like Ratan Tata investing in a technology in Chile to make it viable and, and, and to bring it back to India to transform Indian agriculture. Now let's talk about curing cancer. I lost my wife to cancer. Um, and for, you know, for many months, I didn't leave the house. I was devastated. My wife, Tavinda, was everything to me. I mean, literally, uh, um, anyway, I, I'll, I'll break down if I start talking about it, but she was everything to me. And one, the one thing that kept me going after losing her was that um, uh, um, she said, you know, she, what she told me basically was to make sure no one suffers the way she did. That was her uh, last wish. So what I decided is I'm going to cure cancer. Why, why does someone like me believe you can cure cancer? Because I research advancing technologies. I know exponential curves. I know what's possible. If we can develop, my, and I wrote in my book, Driving the Driverless Car, I wrote about pandemics, the fact that we can engineer pandemics as happened. I wrote about uh, being able to develop these new types of vaccines and uh, cure diseases. I wrote about the microbiome and the, the, what it makes possible. Um, Ayurveda, I'm going to get back to Ayurveda later on. I wrote about it in that book several years ago. I know it's possible <laughs> to do anything. So um, what is cancer? Cancer is DNA mutations. There's not one cancer. Every person has a, has a different cancer. So the problem with cancer is that um, we don't understand it. We have data, but we don't have data. Uh, it's like this big elephant. Everyone looks at a different aspect of it, and they can't see the forest for the trees. So, with the, so I had access to a who's who of the medical industry. CEOs of the pharma companies were ready to give me the medicine. I had labs ready to produce vaccines for my wife, except we didn't know what to target. Like, you know, like with, with, uh, with COVID, we knew we had to target the spike, base vaccine, uh, spike protein, right? We didn't know what to target for her cancer. She had cholangiocarcinoma, which is a cancer which is common in India and in, uh, in, in, in uh, Thailand and so on. But it, because it's not common in the West, no one's focused on it. Why it's an Indian problem? So it's a matter of data, of being able to understand exactly what happened. So I started researching it. And I, with the scientists, and I'm talking about scientists, I'm talking about uh, the top people at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Keith Flaherty, uh, Nabil Bardezi, I mean, you know, names who are legends in America. They were helping me try to save my wife. With their help, I put together a grand plan to cure cancer. And um, I, you know, the you know, I, first thing was, well, let's take it to the American medical uh, institution. But America's medical institution is corrupt. It's not a med it's not a healthcare system. It's a sick care system. It's all geared towards keeping people sick. This is why America spends so much of its GDP on medicine because it's a corrupt system, ingrained. And uh, you know, you you talk about bureaucracy and problems in India. America is exponentially worse than, than, than India in, uh, in medicine because there's so much money being made. <coughs> so the pharma companies do clinical trials. The only goal of the clinical trial is to, so that they can have billion, uh, make billions of dollars on drugs which no one can afford except the rich. The, the hospitals uh, won't share data. In America, medical records still, uh, are having, even though they, for 10 years they've been trying to get standard, standardization of medical records, it's pathetic. EMRs in, in uh, America are a joke because the system is corrupt. So in, America was out. The next in line is China. China is evil. It's, forget about corruption. It's you know the worst of the worst. So forget about China was out. The next thing was India. So uh, in India, uh, you know, to get anything done, you have to go to the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So with the help of some of my friends, I'm not going to name names over here. I got a meeting with with the Prime Minister. Um, you know, this is what I was just saying. The U.S. is making very slow pro pro progress. If you look at the initiatives that they've done over there, it's it's a joke. I mean, the cancer moonshots that uh, Obama and Biden launched, it's a joke. I mean, it's, they're nowhere, literally. Uh, and it's pathetic how far they've come. Many, many years after they launched the cancer moonshot. 
So what I realized was that India can leapfrog uh, the United States and find cures for cancer even before the United States gathers the data that it's looking to gather after spending billions and billions of dollars. So um, I had a meeting with uh, Modi in, uh, Prime Minister Modi in October 2019 in Kavadia, Gujarat. And then I also went to see the Dalai Lama. And I'll get back to why the Dalai Lama later on. But uh, it was a fantastic meeting. You know, for all the criticism that uh, the Prime Minister receives about being the son of a tea, tea seller, Modi is a genius. I mean, I, I was amazed that here I am because his advisors were very nervous about me speaking to him and talking to him like I'm talking to you. But I spent half an hour with him. Uh, within the five, next five or 10 minutes, it was like we were talking as fast to each other. And he was now challenging me, saying, you know, he, uh, the agreement we had was that I'll speak in, in English, he'll speak in Hindi. He said, I understand English very well. And I said, I can understand Hindi, but I can't speak very, very good Hindi. And then he, I talked about uh, you know, genetics and how uh, you can, um, um, I mean, we, we, uh, you know, cancer is a genomic disease. He says, sickle cell anemia be as vaste hai. And I'm saying, this is the Prime Minister of India talking to me uh, about sickle cell anemia and uh, the genetics, genetics, genetics of this. I was completely blown away. I was astonished at uh, how much he understood. So he told his uh, principal scientific advisor, he says, uh, Vijay, I want, um, uh, 90 days I want a, a, pl a plan to implement Professor Wadwa's recommendations. Now Vijay dropped the ball on it, but fortunately uh, the plan started circulating in Indian scientific circles. And Venkat Raman uh, Murthy, who was again uh, Ratan Tata's uh, senior advisor, he was launching an initiative to uh, overhaul India's cancer care system. The Tatas have done a lot for cancer. You know, they lost, uh, I mean, a million uh, uh, square foot cancer hospitals. So Venkat and the team of scientists who had built that were now looking to transform India's broken cancer care system. Why is it broken? Because it's, it's disjoint. There's no you know, central platform for healthcare. You're, you're trying to do some amazing things. I, I know the work you're doing at Niti Aayog. It's brilliant. Okay, I've got to give you full credit for that. However, the cancer system is broken. So depending on where you are in India, you get the wrong treatments, or you get, you know, you meet a doctor who has, who tried something before or read about it. That's what he prescribes. Or you get to a hospital, and all they want to do is treat you the way they've treated other people, where they make the most money. So Venkat and Moni uh, Abraham Kurikos, uh, he was the head of the Cochin uh, Cancer Center. Um, uh, Moni had developed a plan uh, that was published in the Lancet, the most prestigious medical journal about a distributed cancer care system, the most advanced in the world. So Venkat and Moni decided to implement it. And then um, when they saw my, saw my plan, Venkat called me up and said, Vivek, uh, uh, I mean, Venkat is on my private mailing list as a Amitabh, and he knew what I had gone through. He said, Vivek, let's work together. I know your goal is to cure cancer. Uh, I want to work with you on this thing. So we merged our plans together. And uh, there's an, um, a project right now uh, which launched in, in Kerala called Karkinos, which is the most ambitious project of its kind in the world. In fact, they've already now set up 23 clinics. They've developed an IT platform, which is incredible. I mean, uh, in fact, I've already discussed, I mentioned it to Satya Nadella, and I sent details of it to, to Sundar Pichai. It makes all the work that they're doing look like uh, kindergarten stuff, because it's an integrated IT platform for the entire cancer care system. And um, here's a proof of point that I, you know, I talked about the scientists I'm working with at Harvard Medical, Mayo Clinic, uh, and so on. Also the CEO of the American Cancer Society. He's been guiding me. I had them review what Karkinos is doing. They were all blown away. We did a, a, a call with um, the dean of Harvard Medical School and uh, the faculty about two months ago. The dean, George Daly, is, is brilliant. I mean, he, you know, he's, a, he's a very respected person in America. He asked his fac uh, faculty, um, faculty, do you really believe what these people are saying? He didn't use those words. What Keith said to him was that what India is doing is something the United States cannot do. He says, they are so far ahead of us. If this goes the way we expect, they're going to be ahead of the United States' most ambitious goals. The CEO of the Cancer Society said, for 40 years, I've been uh, uh, looking for a way of curing cancer. What they're doing in India is what I've been dreaming about. So they're now advisors to the project. This is happening in Kerala right now. And they're basically rolling it out at 23 different centers over there. And this is going to lay the foundation for curing cancer. It has all of the recommendations that, that I've done. Now, why India? Because India has um, unique problems. I talked about the cancer that my wife has is, is, is really an Indian cancer. 
Um, so, so we have to now get data for Indian cancers. And the key to curing cancers, to get the, understand the data and look at the big picture, India has an abundance of data. This is something that uh, Mithab has said in many tweets, that India is data rich. Right? So it has all of that. It has, a, uh, you know, um, it, it has a, all the things you need to be able to gather the data we need necessary. The cancer spectrum in India, India is just different from the West. We get different cancers here. The U.S. clinical trial system is corrupt. It's geared towards the pharma companies and funding research. It's not geared towards solving the problem. Because if you cure cancer, then the pharma industry goes bankrupt. So therefore, it won't do that. And India has no legacy infrastructure to protect. It has a you know, very solid uh, biosimilars industry, but it's not doing real research in, in curing disease. It's lacking. India can rethink medicine just like it does everything else and make medical research equitable to all. Because at the end of the day, like Venkat, Venkat's goal is to do good for, for India. So this Karkinos venture, even though it's a, a for-profit venture, it's a sustainable for-profit venture. So in it, a, a who's who of, of India has now invested in it, these philanthropists. But what Venkat told the, the uh, investors is, don't expect any major returns. We're talking about profits in the single digits at best. And also that we, the plan is to offer treatments for free. Wherever, wherever, wherever needed. So it's a social venture which is, aims to be sustainable. This is something you would never see in Silicon Valley. No one would put money into it unless you were promising you know, multi-billion dollar returns. So this is something unique about India that if it's, it's entrepreneurs, like Ronnie Screwwala invested in it, uh, Bhavesh Agarwal invested in Karkinos, all with the, with the goal of, of giving back to the country. This is the beauty about India. So India's bold cancer moonshot the idea is to provide low cost of free treatment to millions of patients, literally millions of, millions of patients. And what I want, and this is, was my grand plan, was to sequence a tumor. I want to sequence every tumor. We want to create 3D organoids. You know, I talked about the delay in getting the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the vaccines out there because the testing of it is on humans. We now have the ability to create 3D organoids, which are essentially um, um, data models, I mean, living organisms in which you can test drugs. So you get the tumor samples, you create 3D organoids, you analyze full medical history, and then you test the, uh, the chemotherapies and immunotherapies on the tumor versus on the person, which is the way this clinical trial system in America works. So this is part of the Karkinos uh, thing. And then you invite scientists, from, we open source everything. That's one of the goals, to so make it available to academic institutions all over the world. This is why the Harvard people are spending so much time on it. We have a who's who of Harvard Medical now advising Karkinos because this is the data they've been dreaming about getting. They believe that if they have the data, within the next two years, they'll be able to put uh, uh, Western um, uh, research on an exponential path. We're going to open this up to everyone. The data is never going to leave India, by the way. And this is the key here, that, the, that already Venkat has ordered a million dollars worth of Illumina sequencers. He has the most, uh, going to spend several million dollars on the most advanced equipment available to the world. And the biorepositories are all going to be in, in we, I mean, I was asking Amita for advice on where we should take this. So that's a separate discussion we'll have, but we'll have the biorepositories, everything in India. And then if any Western company wants to use it, they have to come here. They have to locate their scientists over here. Already we have one proof of, of concept, Rakuten, you know, which is um, uh, Japan's um, Amazon. Um, Miki uh, Mikitani lost his father to cancer. He has a $500 million, half a billion dollar initiative to come up with treatments for cancer. When uh, I, I had Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, introduced me to, uh, uh, to Mickey, uh, Mickey Tani, we had a conference call with the Karkinos people. Within 90 days, uh, Mickey is now moving his uh, clinical trials, his technology over to India. So India is going to be one of the first countries to have the most advanced technology in the world. The same thing is going to happen with uh, all of the other things. That, so the Harvard is very likely to set up research facilities in India. And you'll find that India becomes, just like uh, Infosys and you know, a few tech companies turned uh, Bangalore into, a, uh, uh, into an IT hub because they had critical mass <coughs> there. We're going to do the same thing with medical research. Be based on the, the data and the biosamples and the research capabilities that we have and keeping everything, again, nothing will leave India. This is very important. It's going to be tightly secured and so on. But if they want to experiment with the uh, organoids, they come to our labs, they set up facilities over there, you're going to find that within five years, we can, this, and this is what I told uh, Prime Minister Modi, I said that, you know, if you uh, do this thing, it'll cost you about 250, uh, 200, 250 million dollars, 
which is what the you know, moon missions cost India. I said, you're going to build a $100 billion medical industry in this decade. That's what I said to Prime Minister Modi. And I believe we're going to exceed those targets based on how well Carcinos is doing. The largest biorepository platform in the world, which will dramatically accelerate the search for, for cures. This is what's happening in India. This is, what I'm, this is why I'm here. And it's happening without government help based on, uh, on what the entrepreneurs are doing. And then also, this is very important, that if you look at the research on the microbiome, it's all pointing to the gut. What's Ayurveda all about? Managing the gut. There's not enough research done on Ayurveda. This is going to create a platform for testing Ayurveda. And this is why I saw the Dalai Lama, because the Dalai Lama treated himself using Tibetan medicine, Ayurveda, and Western medicine. So this, is, so this is what I discussed with him, and he says, whenever you're ready, I'll hold a medical conference of all scholars, and we'll bring all the knowledge together uh, so that uh, we can now accelerate natural cures. This is what uh, the, uh, so I want to create a platform for uh, testing everything, uh, natural cures to cancer. This will all happen within this decade. All right, I'm going to give everyone a reading assignment, drive in the driverless car, goes through all the technologies, and talks about the ethical issues. The newer version, of the, the Indian version of it, the paperback version of it, make sure you get the right one, has a grand plan that I presented to uh, the prime minister in it for curing cancer. And it walks through these technologies. From incremental to exponential is about how you can build trillion dollar industries. Why is it that Silicon Valley has all these trillion dollar companies? What are the secrets to innovation? That's what this book is about. They're available in India. They only cost about 20, 50 rupees or so. So everyone should be able to afford it. All right, with it, I'll hand it. Uh, yeah, so any, uh, we'll open it up to question answers. We'll have about five or six questions. Anyone? Who can, I, can I, sir, just yeah, one small please. question? Please. Uh, see, I was curious to know, in this wonderful work that you are planning on cancer research in India, other than the names you took, they are individuals and they are kind of angelic investors, aren't you planning to team up with any major cancer research institute in India? There is we already are. I mean, uh, there is one in the called ACTRAC. It is a part of the Tata Memorial Hospital group, of Ratan Tata's group. I'll connect you to Venkat and to Moni and to Ram Das in, uh, in, uh, in Kerala and Dr. Sankaran. Sankar. I mean, these are, I mean, they're already talking to all the major institutions. Oh, they're doing that? They're already doing that. All the Tata Care Cancer Centers. Oh, they're, they're because their, you know, uh, their goal is not to replace any of these centers, but to build on top of them. Yeah, and the reception they've been getting yeah. has been fantastic. And Amitabh had also done a, a, a Zoom call with all of the key uh, stakeholders. Uh, you know, in, in government uh, a few uh, a few months ago, and it was amazing how uh, you know how supportive they were. Or they all were. So Tata is invested heavily. There is a big center in Calcutta, Tata Medical Center. No, no, they all part. Bank built that. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. So names also a part of. I, I, I I'm, I'm the wrong person because I don't even know all these names. I, you know, Venkat uh, uh, and Moni are the two guys I would refer to you. And, I, and if you send me an email, I'll connect you to them, and they can tell you all they're doing. But but I would love to get your help. This is one of the reasons why you know, I've, I've been I'm speaking to Amitabh is because I want Niti Aayog to be part of this thing. In fact, I'd love to have Niti Aayog be my strategic partner because we're going to cure cancer, we're going to launch a green revolution, and, and this is to be done through you because this is on a scale that you've been dreaming about. Then I'm, all of these things I'm talking about will happen in the next one, two, three years. I'm not thinking 50 years from now. I'm not talking about basic research. These are all technologies that are happening now. When I went to Kerala, I was in Kerala for the last week or so, I was blown away with how fast these people have done done things. I mean, it's, I'm an optimist. So <laughs> the, can I the, come the in, sir? Team, what's yeah, that? Just one second, please. Yeah, the Karkino stream has exceeded my wildest expectations. That's okay. how Any research. Anyone young here who wants to, any one of the YPs who wants to ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, so the 23 clinics that you mentioned, are they like treating the people or are they just research centers? Like? No, no, they're level one, level two centers where they do pre-screening because pre-screening is part of this thing. And then they're setting up the advanced cancer center. We were, they were looking for a location for it while I was there where they'll do where will complex cancers. The idea is to, to enable uh, districts all across India to be able to do cancer uh, treatment. Because what happens is very regimented right now that people who are top-notch surgeons won't do cancer surgery because they're not allowed to do cancer surgery. The idea is to give them all the knowledge they need and to, and to set up all the protocols so that it can, cancer can be treated all over India. It's a very ambitious plan. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, 
thank you for a very nice lecture and it was very informative. In fact, I would like to know more about the agriculture technology. Since we could not bring that uh, uh, agriculture-driven technology in our country, after green revolution, we could not infuse new technology. And your younger generation don't want to work on that conventional things. And in fact, what is your plan to uh, this uh, bring this plasma activated? You know, well, this can bring revolution in the to increase the nitrogen use efficiency also in the vertical farming yeah. because there we are having challenges. I'm glad you asked that question because um, uh, I invested in this company in Chile and I saved their butt a number of times and I made it a condition that we had to bring the technology to India first. Okay. So I wrote to uh, Mukesh Ambani, I wrote to uh, um, Anand Mahindra and they both put their teams in charge of it and their teams were really, really excited about it. So the condition was that it has to come to India first and those two guys over there, uh, Narman and Siddhe, uh, Amitha was assigned them to work with me. So they're now becoming experts on plasma activated water. I was asking them, do you have enough time? Amitha, you have to give them more time to work on this because I'm going to keep them 110% busy and they already have 110. You're, you're slave drivers. I want these guys working full time on agriculture for the next few months because we're launching the next green revolution. No, no, we'll put some two more people from agriculture side of it. Because uh, the call that you do with uh, Roger and with Alfredo next week, get. Uh, I, I didn't catch your name, but we should be on that call. Yeah, my name is Neelam Patel. I'm really? taking care of agriculture in DTI. Then you should be on this call and learn about it because we're going to be bringing the devices to India in one queue next year. Okay. Sir. And then um, um, I want to bring this to India before anywhere else because I, and this is why I wanted Niti Ayog to be the experts on this because you'll be, you know, be teaching this to the rest of India. And I also want the manufacturing to be done in India. Yes. So the, the, our, the uh, detailed specs for this are written in a way that um, uh, any major company in India could start manufacturing it. And by the way, the, right now the devices cost in, in a double digit uh, tens of thousands of dollars. The, my goal is to get down to single digit thousands of dollars pa powered by two solar panels, enough for a village. That India can afford. Yes, sir. And replacing okay. all, agri uh, all, I mean, not all, but most chemical use so that uh, we improve, uh, improve uh, uh, you know, productivity in, in 2022. I'm not talking about future. In 2022, I want all this to happen. Yeah, Anna, you wanted to ask a question? No, just by way of information, sir, uh, Venkat from Karkinos uh, is already part of a committee headed by Dr. Paul, which is looking at uh, coming out with a strategy on uh, uh, biobanks. And we have divided it into two. Uh, one is imaging, the other is tissue. So Venkat is very much on board with Niti Ayog. So just by way of uh, supplement information, I wanted to put in this point. And I'll tell you that they're not waiting for Niti Ayog. They're getting into high gear. These people uh, are more aggressive than I am. And they've already started implementing it. They, they, they already bought five Thermo Fisher freezers. They basically more than exist in the whole of India. They have the ability to freeze uh, uh, specimens. The, uh, a banker to just put an order in for a million dollars worth of uh, uh, Illumina sequences, the top of the line sequences, which are not in India yet. He's already negotiated that with Illumina. They're going to be here in the next two months. So they're moving fast forward. What I suggest you do is you learn from them. Let them drive. And, and rather than you know uh, trying to you know, come up with policies, just partner with them and let them lead the way here. That's how smart these people are. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> We started with energy and that technology disruption thing. Uh, have we also thought uh, what will be the alternatives that there will be? What I was thinking with the presentation, there will be an income disruption too. Yes. Like for like, the railways, the main source of freight will uh, is at present is uh, you know, the coal, yeah. which is getting through. That is a fossil fuel will become extinct. So how will the railways and, and that is the bigger thing. Same uh, like your book title, driverless cars. So what will be the, that income disruption which will come? There are going to be major, major disruptions which are unstoppable. I mean, this is why you should read from incremental to exponential, because I walk through the types of disruptions that are going to happen to industry after industry after industry. It's unstoppable. So, so you can save the coal industry for another three or four years, like we're saving the petroleum industry. But ultimately, economics will take over because you're not going to be able to stop consumers. That's why I talked about tipping points. They once you hit the tipping point, there's nothing stopping it. So will it, be, will it uh, actually drive towards the income gap? More of, you know, winding in the sky. Uh, yeah, it will, because that's the evil of technology. I mean, the, um, I, the, a lot is going to happen at the same time, good and bad, good and evil at the same time. And this is why, if, if you, to the extent that you can start learning these things and guiding the country through it, it'll be, um, you know, your job in Niti Aayog is going to become exponentially more important over the next few years, because the rest of the world doesn't understand these things. Your folks are brilliant. I mean, the team I have are here. These aren't government babus. 
I mean, Neeraj was telling me that he is a government <laughs> babu. I said, he really doesn't look like a government <laughs> babu. He looks like a noble human being. But uh, the, you know, the young energy you have over here, these people really can lead the nation. Yeah, Ankur, I wanted to ask something. So on the, the whole thing about the, the getting water to treat it, especially at a, de at a distributed scale, that's something which we've, like, we haven't really solved, even, even in other countries as well. And it, it, it's very expensive to treat water. And these dis decentralized systems, for some reason, there's some issue or the other, whether it's funding or cost. Or Let's talk about that offline, because there are another set of technologies which uh, I plan to work on, which are related to what you're talking about. Let's talk offline on that. Uh, if you email me, I'll get, get you information about it. Because that's another problem I want to solve. I want to clean up the Ganga and the, the Yamuna. Because they, they stink right now. We want to clean this problem up and, and solve some of India's other big problems. There are technologies also in development, which in 2022 we could start testing in India. And yeah. You know, send me an email also. I'll send you information about that. That's yeah. my next big project. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I have a query regarding the biodepository of the cancer which you are having right here. Uh, like when I read the book of the Siddharth Mukherjee in the Emperor of Maladies, it right. talked about the how difficult because the data is very much dynamic. And you talked about like how you are leveraging machine learning or artificial intelligence to solve that. So considering like I have seen some sort of the genomic data set out of for the cancer research, but what makes you optimistic about that? Because the reinforcement learning, even the machine learning, yeah. Uh, okay. Whatever the white, white paper I'm Siddharth Mukherjee co-authored that grand plan that I presented to Prime Minister Modi. Okay. okay. And and uh, as far as the biorepositories go, this is much much bigger than the people in, in at Harvard even considered because we're not only getting um, uh, uh, you see what they do in the West, and this is what the, the Biden's cancer moonshot was was to take um, a, 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 take a tumor biopsy, you kill it in formaldehyde, and then you sequence it. That's America's vision of what, that's you know, 1970s technology. What we're doing is we're taking live samples of the tumor, cryogenically freezing it. So you can, uh, because the organoid technology isn't quite there yet. But in the next two years, it will be. So we're, we're gonna have live tumor samples. We're gonna take saliva samples. We're gonna take blood samples. And we're gonna have complete medical histories. So the, this is why uh, uh, the banker had to get five of these thermos, uh, these uh, uh, Thermo Fisher freezers, because we're gonna have very large bio sample, uh, bio repositories. So you can now st start doing things that they've been dreaming about in the West. You told about the research being open source. Where can I read about those white paper where you have developed all this? Yeah, we can talk. I mean, I can make a lot of this available to you. How we make this uh, available, we still have to figure out. We're going to be setting up a, research, a cancer research center, and I'm thinking of coming and working on that myself for the first few months. Um, because right now, they're just getting the base infrastructure done, of getting the regional centers and getting the distributed cancer center to implement it, and getting the biorepositories done. Next step is what do you do with it? That's where I plan to come back and spend more time in India to get that up and going. And I'd love to work with you folks on it. Okay. Uh, Arvind and then Chintan. One question. Last two questions. When you're saying that there's an exponential rise in the battery technology also, should we then be worrying about the infrastructure for charging because then you can just have solar roofs for the cars? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think we're sort of overestimating the uh, infrastructure problem. This is something which is starting because of the fossil fuel industry spreading misinformation. I, uh, I mean, for the last seven years, I've had a Tesla. Since the first first ones came out, I have solar panels on my roof, and and I don't need anything more. I mean, and then uh, <clears throat> if I was building a new house, I'd, I'd have a Tesla power wall as well. So I'm basically off the grid, and I can run my car and everything. So with solar and battery, you you, you can solve the problem and anywhere and everywhere. And when do you see this inflection point happening that you won't need a charging station at all? Well, well, for the not any charging, you need to have batteries at the home level. It's probably about five years or so, five, seven years maximum. Because the cost of batteries has to drop to the point that you can have enough, enough energy for your house and your car at home. And then the, the solar panel efficiency also has to increase. So this is why you know India feels left out of a lot of these things. It wants to get into uh, solar. Right now, it's last generation solar. Let China you know, sync with uh, the junky solar that they have right now. The new generation of solar coming out with Perscovites and also and uh, you know graphene-based materials. There's going to be a new gen. India should jump on the next bandwagon or do what it did with IT. With IT, India didn't invent computers or worry about silicon. It simply built a layer on top of it. So what India has to do is get in the implementation business of all of these new technologies. 
But in the next five to seven years is when a lot of the tipping points are reached and everything happens automatically. And the, the problems of the infrastructure will solve themselves when the prices drop enough. Because the Indian private industry is very robust. They'll figure it out. Yeah, Chintan. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, just one quick comment and then a question. Chintan is the head of uh, Artel Innovation Mission. He's just come from MIT. What you're doing is beautiful, by the way. I mean, I really admire that. Thank you so much. I yeah. have a question for you about what we are not doing yet. And maybe you have a thought uh, about it. But the comment uh, uh, is, uh, uh, even in terms of how to share that data uh, storage with the world, Solving for solving that problem, also the best people are in India because we have the eye spirit and Aadhaar and other yeah. people. They they know how. If we get them together, they will figure it out better than uh, most people in the world. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. So uh, we have done a lot of work on that already, yeah. and we're talking to some of the countries on that. Yeah, I know those folks also. They're, it's a brilliant crowd. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the question I had was on the institution side, uh, institutional side. So. I personally know several people, several innovators in India, uh, like Alfredo, who think really fundamentally about a, a problem and come up with a solution. Time and again, what I see is that uh, the well, uh, the the one general characteristics of their solution is that it is solving a known problem along a dimension that has never been exploited to solve that same problem. Uh, now. Because that dimension has never been exploited, there is no receptivity to it, there is no industry structure <coughs> for producing it on a large scale. It's absolutely clear that this solution has much greater uh, potential and efficiency, but there is no ecosystem. I agree. Uh, now, so the, uh, and, and, and people like uh, Mr. Tata and uh, Honorable Prime Minister are rare. Yeah. Uh, uh, so how do we uh, create institutions that are receptive to such uh, brilliance? Well, this is why I'm glad you have that job, because I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> if you can figure it out, you will have more innovation than you can ever dream about. <laughs> Even in Chile, like I said, I, I, it, had, it took you know, a chance meeting between me and Alfredo, and me looking at it and, and doing a double take, saying, how could you possibly have done that? And then I you know, looked at it over and over again over two years, and that's when I said, okay, um, you know, I invested myself and I got my friends to invest in it when I was blown away. But you need to really, it's, it's luck and timing and whatever else. But if you can figure it out, you, you, you would have solved another grand challenge. Why did they move away in Chile from the water to the water fertilizer? Because um, when COVID happened, Airbus was going to be funding these. They, they put all the energy into, um, I mean, uh, Alfredo couldn't sell these PWS, these water sanitation units worldwide because he didn't have scale to do it. And then Airbus came along and gave him a lot of money to build the uh, airplane units. And the, the strategy was now to let it be Airbus do it. Airbus had actually, uh, um, their foundation was going to Why give. Why can't it start again with scale somewhere else? But the airline industry is, in, is still recovering from all of this thing. But in the meantime, this happened. And I, and I got, I mean, I checked out of the world for two or three years. When I got reinvolved basically with Alfredo, I invested in him again. And, and we just did a $10 million round of financing for the company. It's now, and the CEO of Siemens Canada, Robert Hart, one of the top executives in Siemens, just joined as CEO of this company. So all of that is because of the breakthrough technologies. But why are they not doing both of them? We, we will. Robert is now has got, uh, Robert really has three groups. One is the water okay. sanitation, and then uh, plasma activated water, and then there's another one for spectral analysis. That is another breakthrough technology which I'm going to work with with Niti Aayog, because that could solve the problem of bioterrorism, defense. But can't we bring this to India? Because Tata has funded it, no? We're going to bring everything to India. Especially the water technology. Uh, everything is going to come to India first, before anywhere else in the world. Good. That's why I'm here. Good. This is why uh, so, I'm spending time all this time with so Nita. I've uh, put Naman Siri on this job, and I'm looking for two people from the two YPs from the agriculture division to work with him on agriculture, YPs. Amitabh has been incredibly helpful. I've got to thank him. Because, I mean, your, your CEO is amazing. That when he sees innovation, he just steps in, takes the risks. He does all the right things. I'm, I'm his biggest fan. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, 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 we, so, so we'll end up with that. I think uh, unless there's some youngster asking a question. Uh, sir, hmm? can ask a yeah, yeah, please. Let that be the last one. I have two questions. The first one is related to the water problem that you talked about. 
So, um, I have read about Procter & Gamble making uh, a particular packet which, is le which costs less than a dollar and it has been used for a very long time, I believe. It has been in use since 2004. And what that does is it uses um, ferric sulfate and uh, 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 some other things and basically clean water and makes it drinkable. And it has been used in Africa for a really you long know, time. I've, I've used that technology. It's yes. baby stuff. It makes it like a little tumbler. Let yeah. alone solve a village's problem. But and it's too expensive. A dollar, uh, you take it to a village and they can't afford it. And it's also not 100%, it's 99.2% or something like that. That 0.8% can kill you. When I come to India, it's that 0.2% you know, that gives me uh, deli belly and makes me sick all the time. It's not no, good enough. I agree with you, but yeah. until we get to that perfect solution where we can 100%. completely change that, people are dying. And well, there are lives that are being lost. Okay, the PWS units, they've been industrialized with Siemens. Siemens is, is building 300 of them for us in the first half of next year. Uh, if we can get uh, you know, uh, Anand Mahindra or some other Indian company to do it, we could produce tens of thousands of these for a small price, I mean affordable by every village, and get them all over India. That's possible in 2022. Okay. Can we ship some question. here to test it out? What's that? Can we ship one or two units to test it out? We can get them, absolutely, we can get them. No problem. You had a second question? And they'll be the Siemens manufactured units. You know how Siemens is, how they perfect, perfectionists when it comes to engineering, these are manufactured by Siemens. Second question. So it's related to the um, of the beef that you talked about, right. basically. So in India, particularly, and this is very specifically about India, because uh, a majority of Indians are actually vegetarians mm -hmm. instead of being non-vegetarians, as opposed to the Western world. So beef is not really the problem. The problem comes when we, when we talk about things that are uh, animal-based products, such as paneer such as ghee, which are such staples in the Indian diet, that it's incredibly difficult to take it out from our traditional food. Right. And I am personally, I have, I'm a vegan. So um, it's incredibly difficult for me to talk about uh, veganism uh, as such uh, uh, culturally. So now the problem that I, I face is that even if you can create meat that is artificially based, the problem still remains because that kind of meat is not being accessible by most of the people, especially in rural India, which is majority of the people who consume meat. And yeah. more and more, as uh, we've also seen that instead of being vegetarians, people have been becoming non-vegetarians as uh, the income in households increase. Right. So this is a problem that you cannot exactly solve by... You, you're process. right. I'm not going to disagree with you on that. <laughs> yeah. So it will happen is that the middle class just like you know, eating Western food is fashionable over here. They'll eat the 3D printed stuff. The poor will still eat what they eat. Yeah. So it'll take 20, 30 years for India to change, which is fine. Okay. It doesn't break my heart. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank, great. Thanks, Vivek. Thanks for, for the wonderful presentation. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs>